Welcome to episode two. Today's episode is just about the Code Zero, a large head sail that sits between the Spinnaker and the Genoa. The Genoa is for sailing closer to the wind and for stronger winds, while the Spinnaker is for sailing when the wind is coming from more astern. If you're a numbers person, when the true wind angle is from 40 to 75, the Genoa is optimal. From 75 to 135, the Code Zero is best. And finally, the Spinnaker from 115 to 155. The sails have a crossover points, so you can avoid frequent sail changes. The Genoa is 42 square meters, and the Code is 79 square meters. And finally, the Spinnaker is a humongous 142 square meters. The size of the sail impacts my choice as the breeze freshens. Is our newest crew member, the Code Zero. It was supposed to come last year. We are doing a hobo job of installing the halyard and tack line system. So this, we think, is the head of the sail. Not labeled. Come on, sail makers, don't be shy. You can put a label on there. Even in French, I don't mind. This is the standard part, that uh, swivel that uh, is there, and this is the swivel that will get changed out on Monday so that this green line goes through here. So that's the top. The brand of this uh, swivel system, they call it in French an imangasseur, which means furler, and the, the brand is called Carver, and Carver is just kind of a bit Gucci bling, so that's why I got it. So this is the top portion. Now let's go check out the bottom portion which is really where the fun starts. A Code Zero sail is originally a rule cheater. The sail is categorized under some rule schemes as a spinnaker and thus avoiding the penalties for having a very large jib. To be considered a spinnaker, a sail must have enough belly. The measure for belliness of a sail is mid-girth divided by the length of the foot. Mid-girth is the distance between the midpoint of the luff to the midpoint of the leech. A synonym for mid-girth is half-width. Under certain racing rules, this ratio must be greater than 75% to qualify as a spinnaker. Since Cyclops' primary purpose is cruising, the measurement is only for nomenclature. After crunching the numbers, I have a very large Genoa, not a code zero. North Sales calls this flat belly sail a code 50. What a furler is. So back in the ancient Mariner, when you had a sail, you hoisted it and you dropped it on a wire and it came in one size, full size. Uh, life developed and they created the jib furler of which I have one here for the staysail and a second one which I'm blocking back here for the Genoa. And they basically take the sail and they rotate around a stay, a big wire. And there's a metal tube, and inside the metal tube is that wire, and the wire spins. I mean, no, not the wire, the tube spins. And so the tube spins at the bottom, and the tube spins at the top. And that allows the sail to get wrapped around it. Well, that was kind of like Generation 1, and it's what we have for the staysail and the Genoa. Generation two was for flying sails, sails that don't sit on a stay. And they created a couple iterations in the process. This is the most recent. And the most recent is that in the luff of the sail is effectively that wire. And so we will use this only for the Code Zero. Some people use it for the spinnaker. I don't prefer it for that. I'll be just using it for the Code Zero. This is the tack line, two to one. And then this line that's hanging out here is the furling line. Now. What's different about the carver from some other furlers is that um, it only goes one direction. So if, you, if the wind were to try to unfurl it, after about three quarters of a turn, a pin engages and stops it from being able to go that direction. So you don't have to be as obsessed as you are in other boats of tying off the furling line because it's already doing that. Um, the second thing is when it does unfurl, it actually just has a clutch and pops out of gear. We're going to check to make sure the pole's all the way out. This is probably one of the more important or dangerous things on this boat, is when you have the sprit out, it has to be fully out 
And the only way you can tell that is the bobstay, which is a line that leads from the tip of the pole down to the bow of the boat, that it's nice and tight. We've gotten the furler all the way to the end of the sprit. And so that's supposed to be on super tight. It's a two to one ratio because the tighter you have that fake stay, the easier it furls. This clutch has a very dangerous label to it. It says, do not open sprit. And what its purpose is, is it pulls the pole out. And as I said earlier, if the pole is not pulled out and it has load on it, then the bob stay will not be activated and it will be, it possibly will break and then you'll have this huge chunk of carbon fiber jousting going on. But to repeat, this clutch, even though you're pulling this way, actually pulls the pole that way. Now in opposition to get your pole back, there's the tack line, and the tack line pulls the tack of the sail down, but when the tack of the sail is already down, when you pull it, it's the stow the pole line. And so that's why we never open it. And even inside, it says, WTF, it is open? <laughs> All my sail controls for the non-flying sails are in the cockpit. However, when the wind is lighter, I will deploy my flying sails. I requested a compact carver winch at the mast for hoisting the spinnaker, code zero, and tightening the sprit line. When hoisting or dropping these sails, it is convenient to have the winch close by so I can do the job incrementally. As at sea, the sail has the primary goal of swimming in the ocean. Looks. Well, right now it doesn't look great, but we'll go figure that out. When I say it doesn't look great, it's got a little bit of, it's not very tight. And that's probably because the pole's not far enough far. Okay, a little disappointment, but we'll see. Maybe it's user error. But you can see the black furled sail is way saggy. Way, way saggy. And that, to me, means that maybe the sail was made too big. Um, I have to make sure that I've done my rigging correctly. Um, and I have the rigger coming Monday for something else anyway, so he can help me. What it's trying to describe is a problem that we had with the Code Zero. We hoisted the Code Zero, and it was dramatically too big. And the sailmaker said, wait a second, I made what's called a masthead Code Zero. Masthead meaning that when you hoist it, it's going pretty much the tippy top of the mast. And the problem is when they rigged the Code Zero halyard, they got confused on which sheaves to use. The Code Zero halyard on this boat should go out of the same masthead top sheaves as a pair of them, one's for the spinnaker, one's for the two to one Code Zero. And what they did was instead, they used the correct pad eye, because you need to have the line attached to the pad eye and then go through the sheave, but they went through the wrong sheave. That meant the top of the sail was ending up almost a meter short of its proper height. About one meter from the tip of the mast, there is a fractional sheave. I had this installed for a possible fractional spinnaker, but currently it should be blank. When Axon, the mast manufacturer, drew the mast diagram, they actually labeled this sheave as the code zero sheave. The rigger then led the halyard through this lower sheave that's about a meter from the tip of the mast. Finally, the rigger attached the dead end to the tip of the mast, but this wouldn't raise the halyard enough. Here is Axon's mast specification diagram, which I have found very helpful. And I must say, even though this mistake cost a bit of time, it let me understand my rigging much better. So I'm actually thankful for it. The next day, the rigger came by Cyclops from Tonnerre Grimaud and quickly rectified the problem. Moving halyards can be tricky since there are some obstructions in the mast, like a cloth tube holding all of my electrical wires. The rigger also taught me about the fine tuning of the bob stay. Millimeters, so 162, uh, so that's four, uh, yeah, 156, exactly. Thank you so much. You got the weight. Okay, my uh, makeup artist has told me that uh, my suntan lotion is not looking good on camera. What we wanted to talk about was the sprit, the pole. And according to the manufacturers, it's supposed to be 1.6 meters long. And that measurement is not from the tip of the pole, 
but from the center of the fitting, and not from where the pole enters the boat, but from, maybe my camera woman can come over and show this, but from the part of the boat bow that sticks out the most. So then you take that vertical plane up and you measure, and for me, I'm getting around 161 centimeters. So that's, but then I have the tape measure to the end. So I take 161 and I subtract six centimeters, which I've already measured to get 155. So I have five centimeters of conservatus from the 160 max, which I think is fine. I'm not going to win a regatta or lose a regatta on that. And my pole will be safely in the boat. So in summary, the distance of my pole in total is around 195, 100, sorry, 189 and a half centimeters. Here I am hoisting the halyard for the final test. As a side note, I also upgraded the carver top swivel. The rigger preferred a different carver top swivel because it has less chafe, and I liked it because I could remove the swivel for the off season without ascending the mast or using messenger lines. Getting hold of the swivel was not easy as the delivery service seemed to be lost. But with help from Carver, we finally met up in the town of St. Key. Success, the Code Zero Halyard is tight. Now, could have had a slightly bigger sail? Oh, stop it, Jason.